These words mean basically the same thing. These words mean basically the same thing. But what about the terms gay and same-sex attracted? Well, consider someone like Dave. As a teenager, Dave realized he wasn't attracted to girls, he was attracted to guys. But because of his religious beliefs, Dave doesn't think it would be right for him to be in a same-sex relationship. And because he's not attracted to women, he doesn't have a wife or girlfriend either. He's single and celibate. And to be honest, kind of lonely, but he tries to make the best of it. Now you could describe Dave as same-sex attracted, but most people would just call him gay. Dave might not fit every gay stereotype, but in modern English, saying a man is gay doesn't mean he necessarily has a boyfriend, or is sexually active, or watches RuPaul's Drag Race. It just means he's not attracted to women, and he is attracted to men. So these basically mean the same thing. Or do they? Because in some churches, if Dave called himself gay, he'd be seen as an unrepentant sinner, even if he clarified by saying he's gay and celibate. On the other hand, if he called himself same-sex attracted, those same church members would embrace him. But if these don't mean the same thing, at least to some people, then why not? And does it even matter what we call somebody like Dave? As it turns out, yes, it matters way more than you would ever imagine. Hmm. There have been Daves throughout history, but until 1892, there wasn't an English word for it. Before then, most Daves just kept it all in their whole lives, maybe never knowing there was anyone else going through the same stuff. But as the field of psychology developed, scientists became interested in learning about people like Dave, and trying to figure out why they had these feelings. And in 1892, the English translation of a German psychology text used the word homosexual, to mean someone attracted to the same sex. So now, the Daves of the world had a word for themselves. Homosexual. That was a big deal. It meant, you're not the only one going through this, Dave. But having a medical term didn't instantly make everything better. It was still something you couldn't talk about in polite society, not even in church. So unless you had a psychologist willing to treat this as a disorder, you might still have to go through it alone. Some people didn't want to be alone, and the Second Industrial Revolution meant American cities were growing, making it easier for those people to find a community of others in the same boat. Since they couldn't meet openly, they formed secret groups at the fringes of society with their own coded slang. And one of those slang terms was gay. At the time, gay meant happy in mainstream society, but in those groups, it was code for homosexual. And for decades, that's how things were. Some people meeting secretly in the shadows, some people going to psychologists for treatment, and lots of people like Dave, all alone, with no one to talk to. But then came the counterculture movement of the 60s and 70s. And some of the people in those secret groups decided they were tired of living in the shadows. They started coming out publicly. And instead of using the word most people knew, homosexual, which sounded clinical and really, well, sexual, they called themselves gay. And that eventually caught on with the public. It was a lot easier to say than homosexual, and there were already lots of other words for happy, so over the next few decades, gay gradually replaced homosexual as the standard term for any person attracted to the same sex. That's why in 1957, a Broadway character could sing I feel witty and pretty and gay, and everyone knew she meant she was happy. But by 1997, if a movie character said, Gay. You're what? He's gay. I heard him! The audience immediately understood that to mean he's attracted to men. And this may sound nitpicky, but it's actually really important. The understanding that gay described people's attractions, not necessarily their sexual behavior, was an important part of why it caught on. And this scene is a perfect example. Kevin Klein's character has been celibate his whole life. He's never had any romantic or sexual relationship with a man. And he's in the middle of marrying a woman. And yet, even with all that, the audience still doesn't need any explanation to understand what he means when he says he's gay. He is admitting for the first time the truth about his inner attractions. Are you really gay? <laughs> Was there... Oh, any other time you might have told me this? 
Now, the word homosexual originally described attractions too, but in actual usage, that wasn't always clear or consistent. And if gay was going to be equally unclear, there were a lot of people uncomfortable with using a positive-sounding term to describe sexual behavior that they might not approve of. But that wasn't an issue once it was clear that gay described attractions. You could be gay even if you were celibate. And this clarity was important to many gay people, too. Most people didn't need a word to describe their private sex lives. They needed a word to explain what was different about them on the inside. This is, this is so hard, but I, 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 I think I've realized that I am, I can't even say the word. Why can't I say the word? I mean, why can't I just say, I'm gay? Gay was the word to fill that void. One syllable to explain, no matter how many wonderful people I meet of the opposite sex, I don't feel for them what straight people feel. Yeah, that's how I feel with you. If there's one thing I'm feeling right now, it's comfortable. And in that same syllable, finally admitting to a lifetime of bottling up feelings for the same sex. When did you first realize that you might be gay? That's the first time, absolutely. I've, that's the first time I've ever felt this way. Also, freshman English. Um, <laughs> We were reading the, the works of Gertrude Stein. So that naturally brought up all these issues. No, actually, the girl sitting next to me brought up all these issues. <laughs> actually, uh, in junior high, I really liked this girl a lot that worked at the snack bar at the roller rink. I guess it's been going on a while. But you've kept it to yourself and never acted on it. And why do you think that is? I don't know. I guess I thought if I just ignored it, you know, it would just go away and I could just live a normal life. This kind of experience is why gay people wanted a word to describe their feelings. And this was particularly important for people growing up in conservative religious communities. It gave them a word to express, hey, I've been going through something since I was young, it's been lonely, it affects how I relate to both men and women, it's made my teenage years feel very different from other people's, and it makes a big difference in my options for the future. That's a lot to say with one word. And that made it a really important word for a lot of people. For someone like Dave, a word like this can communicate so much of what he's going through, especially if he says gay and celibate, to be even clearer. So why would some churches condemn him for saying he's gay and celibate, but embrace him if he used the term same-sex attracted instead? There's a missing piece to this puzzle, and we can find it in 1973. By 1973, psychologists had been trying since the 1800s to find a cure for same-sex attraction, to help gay people who wanted to be straight. They tried everything from psychoanalysis to surgery and shock treatment. Occasionally someone would report that something had worked, but follow-ups would show that it didn't last. And that prompted some people to try a religious approach where psychology had failed. So in 1973, the same year that the American Psychiatric Association stopped treating homosexuality as a disorder, a handful of Christians who didn't want to be gay started meeting together for the first time, forming what would become known as the first ex-gay ministry. Now, at that time, the word gay was still slang, and many of these folks had first heard that word in the underground club scene of the day, a world of sex, drugs, police raids, and a lot of lonely, hurting people. For them, that's what gay was. That underground club scene was the gay lifestyle. So in their minds, gay wasn't something you felt, it was something you did. If you were no longer doing those things, you were ex-gay, even if your attractions hadn't changed. Uh, we had left the gay lifestyle, and, and so we were saying, well, we're not gay anymore, but we couldn't honestly say we were heterosexual. Now, to be clear, they did hope and pray that their attractions would eventually change as well. But in their minds, that wasn't a requirement, because they defined gay as a lifestyle. But as the word gay caught on everywhere else, it wasn't just being used by people who lived a particular lifestyle. It was being used to describe anyone attracted to the same sex. So how could these ex-gays with same-sex attractions justify continuing to refer to themselves as not gay? Well, one popular response was for them to redefine gay, not in terms of attraction or even sexual behavior, but in terms of identity. 
a philosophical identity, a socio-political identity, an identity built around sex, some kind of unhealthy chosen identity. So if gay was an identity, then any person could say, I'm not gay because my identity is in Christ. By this definition, no true Christian was gay. If you were attracted to the same sex, or even having same-sex sex and then repenting, you weren't gay, you had a homosexual problem, or a homosexual condition. And in the following years, ex-gays used a number of different terms for this, including non-gay homosexual, homosexual struggler, person who experiences same-sex attraction, or simply same-sex attracted. And as they shared their stories in certain churches and Christian spaces, some of that language began bleeding over, creating pockets within the Christian community where people were learning a different definition for gay from, well, everyone else in the rest of the world. Today, much of the ex-gay movement has collapsed, and the groups that are still around don't really use the term ex-gay anymore. But wherever ex-gays were most influential, you can still find pockets of Christians who've always been taught that gay is a sinful, chosen identity of some kind, something completely different from being same-sex attracted. And often they don't believe me when I tell them this isn't how other people are using the term. Imagine being a kid today, growing up in a conservative Christian family, and discovering when you hit puberty that instead of feeling attraction for the opposite sex, you feel it for the same sex. And you're terrified of what this means for your faith and your future and what people would think if they knew. But say you get up the courage to tell your parents about what you're feeling. And instead of embracing you and comforting you, they immediately accuse you of choosing to turn from God and take on a sinful identity. You try to explain that this wasn't a choice you made, but they don't believe you. Imagine how crushing that is, and what that does to a young person's faith and family relationships. This isn't some hypothetical what-if scenario. This is happening now to real families. And one of the main reasons is confusion about the word gay. This young person has grown up in a world where gay has always meant attracted to the same sex. At school, on the internet, all throughout society, that's how they've heard the word used their whole life. So when they say, I'm gay, that's the clearest way they have to say, I'm experiencing feelings of attraction to the same sex, and I'm not experiencing any attraction to the opposite sex. But the parents were taught that gay refers to people who have taken on a sinful identity, turning from God and making their sexual desires the core of who they are. So when the kid says, I'm gay, the parents hear, I'm choosing a sinful path and identity because it's trendy or because my priority is fulfilling my every sexual whim. And this is such a shock and such a departure from who they thought their child was that they think someone must have influenced them and that something drastic must be done to change their mind. So they say, no, you're not gay. Gay people are sick. Gay people aren't Christians. I love you too much to let you make the choice to be gay. And what the young person hears is, anyone who feels what you feel is sick. Anyone who feels what you feel isn't a Christian. I can only love and embrace you if you find a way to stop feeling this. And it just destroys them. And look, not all parents are good parents, but I know parents who are good parents, who loved their kids and had no idea this was how they were coming across. By the time they realized, they left lasting scars and they never meant to. When you've heard all your life that gay is a chosen identity, you start seeing everything through that lens. It's amazing how much that one thing alters your whole perspective. A simple misunderstanding about a word quickly snowballs into something else entirely. When Americans from ex-gay groups preached on homosexuality in Uganda, they brought with them this idea that being gay was a chosen identity, a Western movement that people were being influenced or recruited into, something that threatened to take over Africa as well unless someone put a stop to it. And that helped spark legislation in Uganda to imprison gay people for life. Initially, Ugandan President Museveni said he opposed the bill, thinking that maybe sexual orientation was inborn for some people and it wasn't fair to punish them for that. 
I thought there were some people who were born homosexual. If somebody is born like that, are you right to, to punish him? But once he was convinced that this was a matter of choice, something being influenced or nurtured by society, that convinced him to sign the legislation, to stop this Western movement from taking hold. My original sympathy was, these people were born like that, but we are now being told to say, no, no, no. Even the people I was talking to in the West, in the end they told me that there's no scientific basis for homosexuality, that it is all a matter of choice. Really? So when I was fighting, I was fighting a, a wrong war. Because for me, I, I thought, they must, they must be born like that. So now I'm told, no, 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 you, you are wrong, that this is a choice. Since nature is the main cause of homosexuality, then society can do something about it to discourage the trends. That is why I have agreed to sign the bill. And it was almost much worse. An earlier version of the bill called for the execution of gay people. That was toned down only after international pressure. These are our two examples, but I'm sure you can think of many more. And when things like this happen, people always ask me, why does homosexuality get treated as this big sin above all other sins? We disagree on lots of moral issues. Why is this one such a fixation? And there are several reasons, but a big one is the lack of empathy toward gay people among certain Christians. And that lack of empathy is driven in large part by a lack of understanding because of totally misunderstanding what people mean when they say they're gay. And that brings us back to Dave. You may or may not agree with Dave's beliefs, but he and others like him are in a good position to help people understand. Dave's story can be heard in places where other people's stories might not be, because he's celibate and shares those communities' beliefs. The trouble is, if he calls himself gay, those same communities may see him as an unrepentant sinner, just for using that word. So there's a lot of pressure on Dave to either keep his feelings to himself and let people think he's straight, or to use a different term and call himself same-sex attracted. At first blush, same-sex attracted sounds like it would be a clear, unambiguous term to help solve this problem. But unfortunately, it tends to just feed the problem. If Dave goes out of his way to call himself same-sex attracted instead of gay, that just reinforces the idea that gay must mean something else, something sinful that goes beyond same-sex attraction. It draws a line where saying same-sex attracted marks you as one of the good ones, and saying gay marks you as one of the bad ones. What makes this much worse is that the term same-sex attracted can be offensive and hurtful to lots of folks because of its origin in ex-gay groups. Those groups are strongly linked for many people to emotional and sexual abuse, psychological trauma, and lots of other terrible things. Using the term same-sex attracted at all today raises red flags, but especially when it's used instead of the widely accepted term gay. Think how it sounds when someone uses an outdated racial term instead of the current one. The awkwardness of not using the widely accepted term overshadows everything else and suggests to people that something's not right here, especially when the term you do use has a lot of baggage. Plus, gay is just a more helpful term. Gay means attracted to the same sex and not attracted to the opposite sex. Just saying same sex attracted could refer to gay people, but also to bi people, or even theoretically to a straight person having a momentary sexual feeling towards someone of the same sex. And that's actually kind of what the phrase suggests to many people, that gay people are just straight people plus this weird temptation or fetish for the same sex. And that if someone like Dave just resists that temptation and doesn't act on it, he can experience a life like a straight person in every other way. That's just not the case. It ignores so many of the deep questions Dave is facing, questions about romance and loneliness and companionship and more, and it ignores the reality that Dave's brain and experiences are likely to be different from straight people's in many ways that affect how he encounters the world each day and how he relates to both men and women. But really, in the end, the biggest problem with Dave calling himself same-sex attracted is simply that it throws all the other gay people under the bus. Yes, Dave gets to fit in and be accepted, but when Dave number two comes along, or someone's friend or family member says that they're gay, 
the members of this community now have even more reason to think that's a choice. Because, see, Dave is same-sex attracted and he's not gay. And poor Dave, who just wanted to be understood, now finds himself being used as a weapon against others like himself. That's tragic. For these and other reasons, when Christian communities use the term same-sex attracted, it sends a clear signal to many people that this is not a safe place for them, totally apart from any disagreement on moral beliefs. That affects the reputation of all of Christianity. Now, it's not fair to put all of that pressure on Dave. If your story is like Dave's, I am not telling you what language you have to use, because you know your situation and I don't, and you shouldn't have to carry the weight of all of this on your shoulders. Unless, of course, you're a public figure speaking on this topic, in which case, come on, y'all. But my message here is really for everyone who isn't Dave. If people in your church or community are still using the term same-sex attracted and defining gay as a chosen identity or behavior, it's up to you to help them understand, to share with them the history of these terms, and to show that that's not, in fact, how other people are using the term gay, or what most people mean when they say that they're gay. And it hasn't been for decades. And all of us need to be aware that these different definitions are out there so that we can watch for these misunderstandings and correct them before they go too far. Because how you define one word may not seem like a big deal, but when it creates this kind of misunderstanding and harm, that is a big deal. If we can help one pastor to better empathize with the people they're preaching about, or one parent to better communicate with their kid and understand what they mean when they say, I'm gay, we could change or even save somebody's life. And that, 